Um, and and uh, do you know your chaplain? You do. Man or woman? Man. Do you know your chaplain's name? I'm not putting you on the spot any farther. Sorry about that. <laughs> Chaplain has a responsibility, right? Now, if you, if, if, when you get in the military and you go to services in the military, you don't have a lot of choice, do you? You kind of have to, it's kind of like you didn't have choice here. You either got to come to the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, or the Protestant Church, right? And so you all got stuck with us, sorry. And you didn't have a choice as to whether you're going to listen to me or not. You just have to sit here and suffer through, right? Here's what I want you to realize today, is that, and the scripture is really clear in this, Paul's actually saying, pray for us. And when he's talking about that, he's saying, pray for the leaders, pray for the pastors, pray for the spiritual leaders in your congregation, pray for the people who are leaders out. Do you have some, is anyone here a leader out there at the academy? Any student here? None of you are leaders out there? Somebody's, you're all leaders, what was that? <laughs> but you don't have a couple of leaders over you that are students? Captain? What's that? Dorm there are dorm captains? Okay, but they're not leaders? Yes, in a way. In a way? Okay, who's a dorm captain? <laughs> Thank you! Oh, we do have some, so we do have some even leaders, some people with what? Responsibility, right? Okay, now, what happens? Let's just pretend for a moment you don't like your leader. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You don't like your leader, okay? Or let's pretend like this, and maybe it's not a pretense. You don't like the pastor, <laughs> okay? Let's, let's say you, you even think the pastor's boring, okay? You know, like, you know, oh, we have to suffer. Oh, at least I can sleep this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You, know, okay. you have to suffer through just listening to whoever's up front here, right? Do you want to have a really good experience when you're listening to a sermon? Do you want to really get something out of the message? Then you know what you should be doing? Pray for the per person preaching. Some of you who are saying, like, oh, it's another one of these. You ought to be saying, I got to pray for Pastor Bill right now. Because otherwise, I'm going to be bored, right? Yeah, seriously. And, and that's what Paul's going to be challenging us to do. One of the most important responsibilities we have in the body of Christ to see that we're growing in Christ is that we pray for our leaders. Now, we can broaden that too, can't we? For those of you who think that Mr. Trump, President Trump, is just a little bit obnoxious, would it be good to pray for him? I, I can remember when uh, President Obama was, was president, and there were a lot of people who was like, oh, I can't pray for President Obama, right? And, and why? Because he had a different view of his politics. Well, and then what should we have been doing during that time? Praying for him. And we have a responsibility to pray for our leaders. And if we really want to make a difference, we're going to lift them up. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning is to pray for our leaders. And, and, the, and I really want you to think about this. Do I pray? Now, I got a feeling most of you pray at some time. Uh, the statistics are that most people pray, though, when something bad's going on and they need help. That's when they're most motivated to pray. Okay, I'm about to fail this test. I'm afraid of failing the test. And so you start praying, Lord, help me to remember, right? Okay, you're going to the doctor, and the doctor is saying, you know, well, you've got you to come back in. We have some serious things we've got to talk about. Oh, no. And you start to pray. Um, you're, you know that your, your job is up, and that several people are going to be laid off, and you're afraid it might be you. And, and what do you do? You start to pray. When we're in crisis, we pray, don't we? We're motivated more when we're in crisis. But what about other times? And what Paul's going to challenge us to do today is to be praying, to be praying for one another, but especially to be praying for our leaders. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 25 to 28. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know that in Jeremiah 13, verse 3, verse 15, it says, Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. God has given us spiritual leaders who are supposed to lead us, who are supposed to help us get to know God better, who will help us to grow in our service. They're supposed to equip us, as Ephesians 4 says, so we can all do the work of ministry. Who's supposed to be a minister, by the way? Raise your hand if you're a minister. 
Come on, some more hands need to go up. If you know Jesus Christ, are you a minister? Yes! yes. So Come on, so who's a minister here? Every one of you is a minister. Some of you are saying, you're like, uh-uh. No, no, because that's, you got to go to seminary. No, you got to be up there to preach. No, no, no. A minister is a servant. And every follower of Jesus Christ is called to be a servant and to serve Christ and to serve other people. And so, therefore, all of us are ministers. Some of us have a res an equipping responsibility to help equip others to do what? To do the work of service, as Ephesians 4 says. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, C.H. Spurgeon, some of you heard that name? He, he was a really famous preacher, lived a long time ago. He said, dismiss me or else intercede for me. Either fire me or pray for me. One or the other. If you don't like what I'm doing, if you don't want to follow my leadership, then fire me, get rid of me. But if you're going to keep me around, then pray for me. Gardner Springs said it this way, it's a fearful experience that ministers are ever allowed to enter the pulpit without being preceded, accompanied, and followed by the earnest prayers of their churches. It is no marvel that the pulpit is so powerless and ministers so often disheartened when there are so few holding up their hands. When the churches cease to pray for ministers, Ministers will no longer be a blessing to the churches. You come to worship. Do you want to go away with something from the Lord? Then pray for your leaders. Hebrews 13 said, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. <laughs> what did the writer of Hebrews just tell us? If you want it to go well with you in ministry, pray for your leaders. Because if you're not, if you're kind of fighting against them, what's he warn you? It doesn't go well with you, right? And, and students, I'm sure you've learned that already. If you start to argue with Mr. Durbeck, <laughs> has someone actually tried? <laughs> I was going to say, Lord, help you. <laughs> but did it go well in boot camp when you said, no, not going to march that way, sir? Because you at least always said, sir. No, it doesn't go well in boot camp. Come on, vets. Would you really say, nope, don't feel like serving today <laughs> to your officer in charge? <laughs> oh, that'd go real well for you, wouldn't it? Right, veterans? And the same thing, but that's what that the writer of Hebrews is warning us, is that as we, we have this responsibility to be praying for, to be submitting, to be encouraging, to be blessing our leaders, because that way we get blessed. Barclay said it this way, it's a wonderful thing that the greatest saint of them all should feel that he was strengthened by the prayers of the humblest Christians. Paul says, look, your prayers make a difference in what I'm doing. This great saint of the church, Barclay goes on. Once his friends came to congratulate a great statesman who had been elected to the highest office his country could offer him, he said, don't give me your congratulations, but give me your prayers. For Paul, prayer was a golden chain in which he prayed for others and others prayed for him. Hebert said, Paul knew of no faster way to get the gospel through the enemy lines than by recruiting Christian converts into the secret service of prayer. He depended upon it as his basic weapon. Colossians, and as Paul, in fact, he says this more than one place in Colossians 4, Paul said, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on which on which account I am in prison. What's he saying? Pray for your leaders so that God will help them and open up doors to be able to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. 
He goes on in first the, second Thessalonians 3, he says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. We want God's message to get out, so we pray for our leaders. And, and then, well, actually, could I just pause for a moment and say that what Paul has been instructing us to do is to pray for the leaders of the church. And may I ask you to pray for me? I, I, I confess that there are some times that the stress of the coffee shop is getting to me. I'm so thankful for Alan, who's one of our veterans, who's actually working two days a week now so I don't have to make the sandwiches. So he's doing it. He's over today. He's getting one of those uh, quilts of valor. Uh, he's at the, uh, there's a Veterans Day celebration. It's always held at 11, 11, 11. That way everyone can remember <laughs> that, that on November 11th at 11 a.m. Is, is a Veterans Day celebration. So he, they are just about to begin that celebration. The fifes and drums of the mountain will be marching down and, and they'll be celebrating and he will be getting uh, a, a quilt of valor this, along with some other veterans today. And some of our other veterans that are part of our church are there as well. Um, but, but, and I think, I'm so thankful for Alan because there's two days now I'm not having to make sandwiches. But I gotta tell you, I'm getting stressed over the finances of that coffee shop. Um, have you, any of you looked at the back of the bulletin? Have you ever, have any of you noticed that we're like, uh, what is it, eight or $9,000 now? It, it, there's a negative symbol there. That's, that's not a dot on your piece of paper. It's not an accident. We're actually behind in our capital fundraising for the, for the, um, for the coffee shop, which is called um, our Cornerstone Fund. And I, I got to tell you, every, every week I, we're juggling <laughs> What bill do you pay? Now, how many of you do that personally? You don't have to raise your hand. But okay, but, but, but we, most of us do, right? You juggle, which bill is it this week? Okay, D Doesn't that ever cause you some stress? Okay, and especially if you've got the notice in the mail that you're late. And especially when it's like the, the electric bill or the water. Both of those kind of matter at a coffee shop. I don't know why, okay? <laughs> but we haven't figured out how to cook the coffee without water and old power. And so because of that, we, we have to have those things. Well, when those come, like, last, like this last month, and we just finally paid it, it was only $1,200 for the electric bill. Oh, okay, but along with that $1,200 bill is an $800 IRS bill. Well, we're going to put that one on hold for a little while and just have to pay a penalty down the road. Oh, no. Because, but there's also an $800 sales tax bill. Oh, and I could just go on. Could you, would you just be willing to pray for me? And pray about how we meet those needs, those financial needs. And the amazing thing is the other side of that is the coffee shop in the last quarter made $38,000. That's like, wow, right? You know, some of you are like, I don't know, is that good or is that bad? <laughs> okay. For the first year of a brand new business, that means that, that that's like $160,000 for the year. Okay, that's like, well, some of you are still, I don't know if that's good or bad. That, okay, that's really good for a new business. It's all, almost above projections. But the problem is the bills are still bigger than what we're doing. And so we still have to continue to develop that. And most of all, we need to make sure that that is ministering the love of Jesus Christ to this community. If we don't do that, we could be making $200,000 a month and it wouldn't matter. The reason God put us on that corner is to show the love of Jesus Christ. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why I need your prayer, to make sure that we're showing the love of Christ down there. And then in the other ways where I'm serving, you know, so, you know God's kind of put me in a place where I'm helping to examine whether we're going to have incorporation of this community. Some of you probably even disagree with that thought. Well, then even more so to pray for me as I try to give leadership to that examination. That's putting me right in the middle of the town square, so to speak. But why? God's put me here to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. Pray for those open doors. Pray for me as I try to minister to people who come with their, their marital issues, who come with their addictions, who come with sickness, the funerals that I do, because I'll, I'll do them. We open up this building to anybody who wants to use it if they need a memorial service. And many of them that, that need that don't have a connection really to Jesus Christ. Would you please pray for me? that I'll do what God wants 
In fact, uh, let's, let's go on and let's look at this a little bit more. Do you know that prayer is a spiritual weapon? It's a tool that's used in the hands of God to accomplish God's purposes. I appreciate what Stephen Altrug said. He said, Satan targets pastors because the damage is exponential if they fall. One of the reasons why you got to pray for pastors is because we have a target on our back. If we're serving Jesus Christ, we have a big target on our back. And evil does not want us to be successful. Evil does not want us to share the love of Jesus Christ. Evil doesn't want us talking about Jesus anywhere. And if we can get the message watered down, if we can sin and blow it, which we're all imperfect, right? And so evil wants us to fall. Pray also for me, Paul said in Ephesians 6, 19, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. By the way, you know one of the things that will motivate you to pray on a, for a sermon on a Sunday morning when you're listening? Bring somebody with you that's unchurched. Suddenly you'll say, no, Bill, don't talk that way. Oh, I can't believe you're using that song. Oh, no, look at what everyone, no one's saying hello. Oh, oh, no, he's going to talk about that today? Money, of course. Oh, why did I bring them here today? Lord, please help this pastor preach something that's going to speak to my friend. Yeah, you want to get motivated to pray for your pastor? Bring somebody who's unchurched. It'll change you the way you pray that day, I can promise you. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Use the spiritual weapon that God's given to us to break down the walls in this community and wherever you live to help you reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. Some of you are praying for classmates on the campus at Camp Ivica. Some of you are praying for them to know Jesus. Pray for one another so that your witness will be strong and be an example and reach them and speak to them and break down the walls that keep them from knowing that God loves them. We need to pray for protection of pastors against the attack of Satan. Romans 15 says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying for me. Paul had been shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, persecuted in horrible kinds of ways, finally ultimately put in a jail cell and, all, and ultimately will die for Jesus Christ. And he says, pray for me in my struggle. Pray to God on my behalf. What are some ways that you might want to pray? You may want to pray for the encouragement of your pastors because they can, we all get discouraged. Uh, I, I got to tell you, every time somebody leaves the church and says, well, we're leaving, Bill. We, we just got to, we need to find a different church. Uh, we didn't like the music. We didn't like whatever. We don't like you. No, we, they always say, it's not about you, Bill. It's not about Debbie. We think you're wonderful. We love you guys. But we have to leave for X, Y, Z. Recently, our, our drummer left, and, and he said, I, I, I believe that you guys um, aren't, aren't holding to the scripture the right way. You have people who are leaders who are married again, and, and the only way that you can change that is they need to leave that marriage, because God doesn't even see it as a marriage, because you can't get married again. And what do you do when somebody says that, when they're, they're actually saying, you as a church are, are just in a, in a wrong place biblically? And you're saying, but, but doesn't God forgive? And, and is marriage and remarriage, divorce, are they the unpardonable sins? Oh my goodness, if they're the unpardonable sins, how many people that we have that, will, that love Jesus but will never be allowed into heaven because they've sinned? And it's heartbreaking. And when somebody leaves, you, you, you're just crushed by it. I, I can just tell you. Debbie and I remember and we feel the pain. And, and, and what's sad is the person can be sitting there. We love you. We care about you. But we still need to leave. And, and our hearts are breaking. There are many times that, 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 that we get just worn down and beaten just by ministry. Pray for your pastors and their discouragement. Pray for their wisdom. That they'll, that they'll know what to do when God, when they're given all these different challenges. How do you handle each person who comes to you and asks for help? The people who walk up, because, and they've got to talk to the pastor. Even though we've got mountain help and wonderful people that are serving there, we still have people coming to Bill and knocking on the door and, you know, help me, help me. How do you know what's the best help to give them? Pray that I'll have wisdom and that your pastors will have wisdom, that the leaders will have wisdom as they try to serve people. Pray for our faithfulness. 
that will be faithful to what the Word of God says and nothing else. That if the, the Word of God says something, that we'll preach it and teach it without exception, without watering it down, regardless as to how people react, that we'll preach the truth as God's given to, to us and as it's spoken in his word. Oh yeah, and pray for our marriages and our families. Pray for the relationships I have with Debbie and that every pastor has with their spouse and, and, and with the, the, their families because their families are under attack. Pray for them and, and, and pray for strength to handle all the different pressures. Do you think pastors need prayer? They're not the only ones. Pray for one another. You have a sheet in the, in the worship bulletin. I, I, frankly, I've got to confess to you that I'm surprised at how little that sheet gets used. It's a sheet for personal prayer requests. It's a place for you to actually write on it. Uh, and, and you can even say, I want this confidential. I'm only gonna, uh, and that means only Pastor Bill is going to be seeing it. Uh, or the prayer team that prays on Wednesday morning. Uh, we have a huge prayer team that comes here on Wednesday mornings. Do you know how big it is? Sometimes two, sometimes three. We have our life groups that pray and pray for people and pray for one another. And so we actually have three or four life groups that are, that are praying for one another. And, and we need to be doing that work of praying for one another. You need to be praying for one another. And, and uh, folks, I just got to warn you. There is a pride that is in the way of us allowing others to pray for us. And pride is not a healthy thing. When your ego says, well, I don't want to share. Why? And, and I understand. Sometimes you say, well, I don't want to share because I just don't trust them. Really? Have you been that broken by somebody praying for you? Then at least find a couple people who you will open up with. And you'll be honest. And, and they can even be truthful with you. And you know that they're going to pray. And, and could I just say this also? When you pray for somebody else, don't wait and say, I'll pray for you later. The best time to pray for somebody is, Sydney, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? And Sydney says, yes, in fact, and you say, okay, good. I'm going to write that down when I get home, which is, I mean, I'm going to forget, okay? You stop right then, and when you're talking with Sydney and she shares something, you pray right then with her. Even out in public? where somebody might hear and see, who cares? Pray with one another. And in your, in your uh, bulletin today is a sheet that I really hope gets used. If you don't use the prayer sheet to share prayer needs with us, would you at least use the next sheet? And that's a sheet that, uh, that has our missionaries on it, the missionaries that we support. Would, would some of you commit to praying for them? Some of you students are saying, you know, well, I'm leaving here, so I guess I don't have to do that. Really? You've become a part of us. You're part of our family. Uh, and so would some of you maybe even say, I'll pray for some of those missionaries even after I live he leave here. You know what? I'd love to hear from some of you students. I'd love to hear five years down the road what God's been doing in your life. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten a few of those messages back, and it's amazing. But, but we'd love to hear. In fact, I'd love to hear of a time when you say, man, I'm struggling. You know, we've, we've been on the battlefield here for several months. And I've seen things I just never believed I would see. And I just need somebody who loves Jesus to lift me up. And we'd love to be that person. Christian, you're on the battlefield of life. Some of you are running into discouragement and, and questions and doubts and sometimes you're just in pain and you need some prayer-filled encouragement because you're on the battlefield. And I'd love to be able to pray with more specificity, with more detail, rather than just, okay, well, God bless Ron. Lord, help Alex. Lord, touch Stanford. 
But when you share, you open up the doors for prayers to become even more powerful. Pray for our missionaries. And here's one of the things I can promise you. When we pray for one another, we grow. And when we pray for one another, guess what? When we pray for somebody else, what does that do for our burdens? What does that do for the things that, are strugg- that we're struggling with? It starts to lift them off of our shoulders as we start to pray for others. Paul goes on in his text. He said, pray for us. I am encouraging you to pray for us and to pray for one another. But then he goes on. And he says this really interesting thing. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now that stopped about the 13th century. And the reason why it stopped is just, it's now down to just greet one another. Why? Because unfortunately they weren't doing it with a holy kiss. Right? And it started to be that guys were kissing girls and stuff like that and girls kissing. And it's like, you know, whoa. No, this is supposed to have been about a spiritual blessing of greeting of one another, a welcoming of somebody, a reaching out of the hand and, and saying, welcome, it's good to see you, or rejoice, right? It, it, there should be this sense of, of, of us communicating the love of God to one another. Nobody should get out of a worship center on a Sunday or whenever you worship without somebody giving them some kind of hug, some kind of greeting, some kind of affirmation, some kind of welcome. He's saying, greet one another with a holy kiss. That doesn't mean you got to go back to the Eastern pattern. And, and yet, if you're in there, do their way, right? And it's the kiss to the air. Those are really the goofy ones, right? Have you ever seen that? It's the kiss to the air. You don't really kiss the cheek. And I, okay, it's not about the kiss. It's about are you greeting somebody eye to eye, face to face, welcoming them, truly expressing the love of God to someone else. God's called us to do that for each other. So he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another with the love of God. Express it to people. Share it with one another. And do it in a way that honors God that's not about you. James Denny said, show your Christian love one to another frankly and heartily in the way which comes natural to you. Do not be afraid to break the ice when you come into a worship celebration. There should be no ice there to break. Greet your brother or your sister cordially and like a Christian, assume and create the atmosphere of home. Would you really have somebody come into your house and ignore them? Do you get it? Seriously, would you invite, somebody comes into your house, you open the door, and you, you, you don't say a word to them. Just open the door, and then you walk away. Like, am I supposed to come in? What? Would you really do that? You'd welcome them. You'd greet them. You'd say, come on in. You'd show them where the bathroom was if they needed it. You'd invite them to sit at the table. You'd, you'd t- converse with them. Do we do it in worship? Do we welcome each other? And God's called us, greet one another with a holy kiss. And by the way, can I just say this? Don't sit there waiting for somebody to come greet you. (laughs) Well, nobody's coming over here to greet me. (laughs) I would greet them if they came to me. I would greet them if they came to me. God's called us all to be the ones going to someone else. Don't sit and wait. Because you're going to miss out if you do. By the way, if you can't greet somebody else with love, then what is going on inside of you? Maybe you need to ask yourself what what you need to change so that you can greet somebody else with the love that God has shown to you. So Paul says, pray for us. Greet one another. And then his, his third instruction as he's ending this letter, he says, read this letter, read it out loud, read it in all the churches, Pass it around. Now, there's a couple different reasons for that. Number one, how many people in, in that day could read? Well, a ton of them couldn't. So if they got a letter, it's like, you know, well, it looks pretty. <laughs> okay, it's uh, kind of neat. It's on parchment and all, and there's all these markings on it. No, no, you had, somebody had to read it out loud so that everyone could hear it. Everyone could see and, and hear what, what God was saying through them. 
And he says, I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. What's he also saying? The body of Christ needs the milk of the word of God in order to grow. So share the word of God with one another. Speak the word of God to one another. Pray the word of God for one another. But to let the word of God, which is powerful and God breathed, and, and the word says it won't come back to us empty if we use the word of God. So use the word of God to minister to one another. And then he concludes with a really simple statement. The grace of Jesus be with you. It's a statement that he uses multiple times as he ends his letters. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. 1 Corinthians 16, 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Galatians 6, 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Philippians 4, 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. 2 Thessalonians 3, 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Philemon 1, verse 25. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 2 Peter 3, 18. Peter even does it. It's not just Paul but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be both glory now and forever. Amen. And the last verses of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. And what does it mean? It's by grace we are saved, not of ourselves, lest any one of us would boast on our own. Grace is a gift. It's, it's charis. It means it's something that's come as a gift from God to be, to be receiving of grace. It's what none of us deserves. Or here, the Old Testament, the word for grace is hesed, and it means loving kindness. And Paul ends his letter with this kind of challenge to all of us. God loves you. Jesus Christ loved you so much he died on a cross for you. And he wants to continue to show you his love because you are special to him. And so he uses that phrase, the grace, the love, the kindness of Jesus Christ be with you. It's not just a tag on, God bless you, amen. Gesundheit. No, no, it's so much more than that. It's, it's I want you to go away from here knowing that you're not going out of this room alone, but that Jesus Christ, who loves you so much, is going with you. That you don't have to face whatever you're going to face this week by yourself because Jesus is going to be with you. God the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus who loves you is going to go with you. So the grace of Jesus Christ go with you. So please remember, pray for your leaders. If you think of it, pray for me. Pray for one another. Let the love of Jesus so touch your life that you become a greeter of others with a holy kiss, with one that blesses them. And let the word of God even if you only know John 3, 16. <laughs> Let the word of God be something you share with people around you. And the grace of Jesus Christ go with you.
God, thank you. Today we've um, attempted to honor our veterans to some extent, Lord, and there's, uh, frankly, God, uh, it's almost impossible to really do. For those who've been on the battlefield, all we can say is thank you. May the grace of Jesus Christ comfort them. Heal the memories. Not just the physical wounds, but especially the emotional wounds. Lord God, teach us the power of prayer. That there's this amazing partnership you've invited us to join that you actually await our conversation, that you invite us to share in doing your will by prayer. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that no one goes away from here today without feeling your love, without knowing how much you care about them because you are gracious and it has nothing to do with how any of us behave. You simply love us because you love us. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. So one of the things that we've been announcing that we're going to do today is we want to take a special offering for the memory Bible sticks that will be given out uh, to soldiers. Chaplains request these Bible sticks. They're again given out to the soldiers. Um, and, and there's thousands upon thousands of them that are around the world. Uh, by the way, students, the faith comes by hearing is going to send us one for each one of you. We've got 35, I believe it is, that are coming that are going to be shared with you. Also veterans, they're planning on sending us one for you too. They wanted you to have the word of God as well. And so that's all going to come as soon as we send them our offering. <laughs> okay. So this is, it's a partnership that we're having with Faith Comes by Hearing. But to describe that just a little bit better for you, please watch this video. One Bible stick costs $25, but it's not just the Bible stick that comes for that $25. The Bible stick goes to the soldier, and then also a DVD CD goes to the family so that they get the Bible for them as well. And there's, so there's a mixture of support there, both for the soldier and a member of the family. So $25 is actually getting more than just the Bible stick. So if you want to support at least one Bible stick, would you please give a gift today of $25? There's a sheet in there where that you can mark. Uh, by the way, 
if you're trying to divide your offering, there are some offering envelopes back here on the back. I don't know if uh, Wade, if uh, you and Paul want to just grab some of those envelopes and walk around. Uh, whoever else is taking the receiving the offering, David, are you doing it? Yes, whoever else is, just take some of those around in case if you want to give an offering that's specific, even if it's only a dollar or whatever, that goes towards the memory Bible sticks. We want to make sure that every dollar that's given for the Bible sticks goes to the Bible sticks. So, so please consider that. It's an opportunity for you to help a soldier be supported and encouraged by the living word of God. Anyone else need an envelope? Just raise your hand so the guys can see. If you drop it in the plate, we won't know that it's for the Bible sticks. So, and so just, just uh, write it on your envelope saying, I, I wrote a check. <laughs> so that the counters are tell Wade so he knows because he's counting. <laughs> okay? Uh, God bless. And um, please uh, consider what gift uh, you can give. Uh, with that also, the, the, over there, with that also, uh, your prayer requests are an offering that you're giving to the Lord. You realize that, don't you? When you share a prayer request, you're saying, God, I trust you. God, I believe you care about me. And so I'm willing to open up this need to somebody else to let them pray for me as well and to join this partnership with you and me and them. And so I'm putting that prayer request. So please put that in the offering plate as an offering to the Lord. Father God, I, I pray for the soldiers. And um, I thank you, Lord, that at least uh, it seems like they're respected more than they were back in the 70s. God, every time I think of Veterans Day, there's a part of my heart that just breaks for every soldier who came from home from Vietnam. just like the soldiers today are coming home with all kinds of aspects of PTSD. They did, and they weren't welcome. So many of them were forced to go onto the battlefield. Their, their number came up. They were drafted. They didn't have a choice. And yet they came back, and they were spit at and mistreated. And they just tried to do what they were called to do. And so, Lord, I pray for your healing for every one of those veterans from Vietnam. I thank you, Lord, for the, what's taking place right now in the next few moments, probably, as Alan receives his quilt of valor. I thank you, Lord, that you're giving him and others like him peace. Thank you, Lord, for soldiers that who are risking their lives every day. Some who have been going back multiple times to Afghanistan or Iraq. And their hearts hurt. I pray for your healing. For our young people in the academy who are preparing to go to serve, pray that you'll give them all the ability to learn and learn well, to gain the wisdom that they need, the insights they need, the understanding and all the tools to be able to serve this country and most of all to serve you. Pray that you will bless them, protect them, guide them, lead them, and help them to sense your presence every day. And for every soldier that's out there serving right now, wherever they're at, around the world, I pray that each one would know that you love them. And Lord God, help us to be people that bless others with the grace of Jesus Christ. So Lord, receive our offerings now. In Jesus' name, amen.